You are listening to The Tracy L. Clark Show with me, Tracy L., where I'm going to empower you and teach you how to live your extraordinary life. Tune in every Tuesday, 8 a.m. Pacific, on Transformation Talk Radio, where I combine ministry, science, and spirituality to reveal the steps you need to let go of your perceived limitations. Have you had the limiting self-talk over and over? Have you noticed you allow your fears to hold you back? If you're truly ready for change, I invite you to join me, Tracy L. Clark, and start your journey of transformation now. Welcome back to another episode of the Tracy L. Clark Show. Of course, I'm your host, Tracy L., and we have an incredible show for you today. I brought three incredible women in who are all part of our Miraculous Living Program, which is a program that helps to keep you shifted, aligned on your mission, helping people in the world where they're going. And today, they're also all mothers. I have a lot of conversations, and I have a lot of people that always ask me, Tracy, what's going on with our kids? How can we help them? How can we empower them? What else can we do to make it better for our children? And that's why I wanted to get this conversation going. If you know me, I'm known as a body regeneration specialist or the body whisperer. What does that mean is I actually developed this system based on having to restore and repair my own life. But I'll tell you guys, one thing I learned is once I actually understood how to repair and restore my own life, when I was given very bleak outcomes, I realized how it also not only shifted my physical health, my relationships, my emotional health, my finances, my career. So getting in tune with who you are is what it's all about. So I want to encourage each and every one of you to go to tracylclark.com and download your free 18 minute clearing out the weeds because we want to keep you shifted in line. It's a clearing. That is what it is. So I don't want to take much more time on that. I want to welcome all of our guests today. We have Sonia with us, who is also a business owner of her own right, helping and changing the world. And she's mother of two. (laughs) We have Doris, who is also a businesswoman herself, changing the world. And she is also a full-time mom as well, because we're all full-time moms. (laughs) And we have Tasha as well. And you know what? She's also her own entrepreneur. They're all entrepreneurs with us today. I Like, welcome. (laughs) You have to put up your hand. We'll ask. I want to, um, you know, as business women and out there changing and making a difference in the world of how we see it, I wanted to start this conversation around children. You all know it's dear in my heart that we get this, you know, working on getting this new program set up to help kids understand more of what's happening and transitioning and what you find from your own children and the kids that are coming. And I know they're all different ages from high school all the way down into Kesha's young children. What's some of the most common, um, the most common ideas and thought processes that you hear from your children that are disturbing that within their reality? Generally, I find that uh, they've got a lot of frustration as they get older. Yeah, you know they well, started out at a young age with just loving the environment, and then as they see it's progressing, it I feel like they feel a little bit more defeated every day or misunderstood. Yeah, I think there's a lot of there's and this is one thing I like about the energy world that, you know, eventually I hope we can get more kids to understand is that there seems to be so much fear of where am I going and how do I fit in these systems when I don't feel like I fit in the systems. Kasha, do you notice that with your children? Every day, like uh, right now, uh, the huge thing that I've noticed is bullying at school and school doesn't have any ideas how to deal with that they're trying to I don't know uh, make an excuses for a person that is bullying but they're not teaching uh, kids how to actually deal with that when they're bullied and it's a huge problem I think that problem too that people don't talk about especially with bullying and children and then they don't want to say anything because they don't want to create more bullying but unfortunately we're programmed around bullying every day of our lives. Like you just look at politics, they're bullying each other. Look at religions, bullying each other. Look at races, bullying each other rather than people. And then they say, don't bully. And and then I hear teachers talking about how teachers are bullying teachers. And it's like, we're not really teaching children how to communicate, how to be more tolerant, how to understand that usually when people are bullying, there's that underlining, it's a fear. It's they're scared. That's why they're bullied because they're afraid they're going to lose something. And I think that's one of the big messages we have to get 
ki kids and, and adults to understand is when people do bully, it's really connected to a fear that they're going to lose something. But again, then that's that challenge, right, of getting, so for Kasha, getting your kids to go and understand that concept, then they're just thrown back into a system that reflects the negative back to them again. And they, I, I always explain that to my kids and they understand that. But at the same time, if, for example, any of my kids, if they want to stop that in any way, then they're accused of being, I don't know, violent or whatever, right? And they are not allowed to say anything to hurt anybody's feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So you've given them tools to say, you know, you can stand up and say, no, that's okay. But then it comes back at them where it's like, no, it's not okay to speak what that truth is. It's very, it's very contradicting in the school systems. Mm -hmm. I think it's extremely hard. I know my children are now out of university. All your kids are still through the system. Um, what's your perception? Like, I don't, when I see these children and I see their pains and I see their hurts that they're going through, I don't actually see any systems changing to benefit them. Sonia, have you noticed anything? Your kid, I know your children are in private school. Mm -hmm. Do you notice anything different? Sadly, no. So I think that it's quite important as parents that we really get involved because I think the school system is not going to give us that. And unfortunately, there seems to be a big gap in teaching the kids to become a little bit more empathetic and the whole um, energy behind empathy. And then when anything goes on at school and the kids come home and explain to me, yes, as Kasha says, it's important to stick up for yourself and defend yourself. But I really try to kind of step back and, and teach them a little bit about let's for a minute try and understand what that child is going mm -hmm. through or their home life, because that's really where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And then it, they, it, it kind of for a second allows them to step away from the fight energy or the defense energy. And it just kind of brings it back down to empathy, which I think mm -hmm. we're really missing. Yeah. I have to agree that empathy and humility, they're the two things that are really taken out of our systems and that has to be taught at such a young age. One of the things I love about you three and what you're doing is that you are, you're a pillar of showing and teaching your children about empathy and humility and compassion. And it does start at home. And unfortunately, a lot of these children don't have that at home. They don't have parents that are aware and looking outside of the box or looking at how they can maybe look at where that child is coming from. I remember when I was really small, I used to have to walk by a, I went to public school and I used to have to walk by a Catholic school. And the Catholic school, for some reason, had these big bullies that would sit up front and they'd throw rocks at us and snowballs because they didn't like the kids in the public school. And I would like, you would, hi yeah, you would hide and you would like run and you'd have to find multiple kids to walk. It was really a horrible experience. And to learn later that the biggest bully, of course he was the biggest kid, right, at that school, but the biggest bully was going to a home every day where he was being abused. Mm -hmm. So he was taking that out on the kids and he couldn't do it in his own school because it was Catholic. So he'd do it at all the public school kids right. that would have to walk by. And so I think that's exactly where, where that, I love that of starting. And have you, have you, when you talk to your children, like Doris, when your kids come home from school and they talk about, where their next steps are going or where their their life is going to take them do you find their dreams and visions are becoming more live or do you find like it's becoming more muted like almost like i don't know where to go well exactly that they don't know where to go because i like myself my children are very creative yeah. and so they want to do things that are very outside the box which i encourage but now they're so encouraged for the university route and i say well I'm not opposed to you not going to university, but I want you to have an understanding to go where you love, where you're going. Mm -hmm. And if this means you have to take time off, it's me to encourage that, but they get put in that bubble of judgment if they don't. And I want them to love what they do. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love this point. If, if the other two of you want to chime, chime in, because I see children, even in my work, that are in grade, you know, six, seven, super stressed out. And I'm like, what are you so stressed out about? You're supposed to be having fun. I'm like, what's this thing I'm seeing around, like, 
making life plans. So the way the energy comes in, right? It's like, I got to make life plans. I'm like, what life plans are you making? You're like grade six. You should be thinking about going to the beach and having a good time. And they're like, Tracy, I'm being so pressured of what I want to do when I grow up. And I think this is the one thing in society people are listening. It's got to stop telling kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? I didn't know I wanted to do what I'm doing today and love what I'm doing. I didn't start that until literally I was 40 years old, right? Like I was in the space long in my early 30s doing things and having fun, but following old systems. But if you'd asked me if I was in grade six or seven, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. I changed it every day. But again, that's that pressure, right? What university, that university will define who you are. And you just can feel the energy of how heavy that is. If you don't have this university, then you're not going to be defined right. Then you're not going to fit, which I think that whole paradigm, it's got to come down now because who cares if you're 19 or 18 and want to take a year off? Then people say, oh, well, you'll never go back. You got to, you don't, I don't know. Did you guys know who you were at 18 or 19? Would any of you predicted you'd be doing what you're doing today at 18? I still don't know what I want to do. I say that every day. <laughs> still changing all the time. All the time. I, still evolving. I love it. And I think that's the fun thing is we are always changing. We are always growing. I think this is a big thing that kids really really need to know and hear and parents if you're listening listen you don't stop forcing your children to say if you don't pick this school this time I don't know there's a I don't know if anybody knows the answer to this because I I know there's a stat you can google it but there's a country somebody was telling me quite a long time over they actually don't in, they don't encourage you or want you to even look at university it's like Sweden or Netherlands somebody's going to correct me out there please do Till you're like 26 or 27. It's like not even looked upon that you don't go because they say, why would you go? Because you don't know what you're going to do. Right. And this, you can see this kind of stress and like kids, I'm he, like, and you guys must hear this from your own children, children getting ulcers, children getting sick, children getting anxiety because they're being so pushed. Have, have you noticed that or heard that from your Kesha? Have you heard that from your, young, I know your kids are a lot younger. Yeah, so uh, my oldest one, she's turning 13 and she comes plenty of times. I think she's just getting that fear from school and that collective consciousness, right, of you have to know what you're doing, like at the age of 13, like, yeah, uh, like I try to uh, use my tools that I learned from you, right, and I am uh, teaching her how to do that, how to make um, herself centered yeah. and remove that fear and kind of follow her heart because like Doris, right? Uh, I want them to find that passion and make their living around that. Yeah. What do you help other people? What would you guys say? A lot of parents say, oh, okay, I hear this. I'm going to throw this out of you. Oh, follow your heart, follow your bliss. What does that mean? Oh, you know, you're not going to get a proper job. Um, I know what I would say to those parents, but what would any of you say to those parents? Because a lot of that energy seeps into the kids, right? If you don't have this degree, you're not going to get a job. And we all know most people have their degrees, don't even use them anymore. But what would you say to those parents that are listening where it's like, well, that follow your heart is kind of woo-woo stuff. It doesn't work anyways. What I do usually say to people in the nicest way possible, a lot of them are projecting their own wishes and wants on them. So because of that, they put that extra pressure on the child and it almost sort of says, well, you need to kind of do what I didn't do. This happens a lot, not all the time, but it does happen. Oh, you I just hit a, a big one, a big one. I wanted to be a dancer and I didn't. So I'm going to push you into dancing. Push you into everything. I didn't get a chance to do all these activities. So let's put you in every activity possible to get the chance I didn't have. But again, you know, their dreams will be what they wish, right. but they don't have the opportunity to dream because they're too busy. Yeah, I love what you said there. The guys, you got to listen to what Doris just said. So if you're listening, you know, on the iTunes and you can't see her beautiful face, you have to go to Facebook or YouTube. <laughs> but <laughs> I, you know what? These are beautiful women. I love what you just said here. They're so overloaded in activities. I get chills. They don't even know how to dream anymore. How many of you guys listening right now have your kids in so many activities you're not letting them dream. And if they can't dream, how are they going to know what they want to do? My how daughter's constantly in that mode. She's always dreaming. She goes, I'm going to move to California. So she plans her trip. And then she actually plans it through. And I said, well, I'm not going to discourage it because she'll change it at mm -hmm. some point and something new will come in, but it makes her happy. 
I'm not going to discourage it and say, oh, no, you'll never go. You'll never make it. Well, she may. I never know. I don't know how it'll turn out. It may be when she's 30. It could be when she's 18. These YouTube stars, I don't know what they're doing these days with their dreams. I encourage whatever they're doing because they're successful at what they do. They're dreamers, but they're successful at it. Yeah, and I think, um, Sonia, I'd love your opinion on this because uh, I love what you just said there, Doris, you, and one of the things that, that happens in this system that gives children so much anxiety and nervousness and stress out when they're young in school is exactly what you just said. When you and I were all in school, all four of us, we didn't have computers. We, didn't, we had no ability to do this. So even the idea of getting a YouTube job, like in terms of how some of these have made it their jobs or their Instagram influencers or whatever, it wasn't even a possibility. And I, I think a lot of the school stuff that stresses them out is the kids know all these new jobs that are coming are not, they're not the way they are right now in the universities. They're not the way they are in the school systems, the way they're coming out. There's so many new jobs. Like I heard a stat the other day that I think it was like, they said 75% of everything in the next five years is going to be so AI. Like you better make sure you have a new job ready to go. And I was like, Whoa, that's high. Right. For me. Cause I, I it's new as we watch technology. So Sonia, what do your kids say about that with like, cause when we when kids are getting so stressed out and it's creating so much anxiety for them, cause we know when they get there, what are they doing now? They're turning to alcohol, they turn to party, they turn to drugs because they're so afraid to speak the truth to their parents. What do you hear from your kids around, you know, the new things that are coming out versus the old systems that we're living in? Um, well, my kids are pretty open because I'm, I, you know, maintain a very open discussion and discuss these things with them all yeah. the time. So, you know, I encourage them about, you know, and, and discuss AI with them and the possibilities. What's the sad thing that I see as a parent is I'm actually really glad that I grew up in the seventies because, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's a tough gig right now for these for these millennials but um you know with the with youtube and all of that and social media there's just unfortunately they're subjected to a disillusioned um concept of what reality is and they're all at this race to yeah. kind of become famous and to become rich without mm -hmm. the hard work that let's just say all of us have done to get to where we are today and are still working hard and I feel bad for them for that because it's not the reality. Yeah, they look at those snippets. I guess the reality is they have different ways of having work. So they have new opportunities that we didn't have. But if they want to be flesh in the pans, you can. But exactly that, that ethic is that's I think where people say oh millennials are lazy or people are lazy. I'm not I don't agree with that I, I think I see a lot of hard-working millennials but I think you're exactly right they've missed their connection they they're not connecting properly they're not listening to what their bodies are saying they don't have any form of faith component because yes they've rejected a lot around religion which I do too I think it's about connection and creating strong relationship with God or universe divine whatever people want to say and I think that's been so skewed for them that they're, it feels like they're just rejecting everything. And you're correct. Like when we look at everything is documented now, like there's no, these children have no privacy. Where does that come up for them? I don't even know how you teach that to kids. Does anyone know? Do you guys have those conversations with your children? Like careful what you're posting. Oh, all the yes, time. All the time. Yeah. Oh. See, my kids are older. They don't do much of that anymore. So I wonder, like, from your children's perspective, being in school, because people can take random pictures of them. And I know when I, like, years and years and years ago, when I was in film and television, we couldn't even shoot on the street without getting that person, if they were going to walk by an NDA or, you know, and then all this documents of release, a, a photo release and stuff. Like, we needed all this stuff from them. It was like so many documents. Now, like... <laughs> that whole that whole premise of privacy went out the whole window like you couldn't put a random in your shot without getting them to sign off before <laughs> right everything is being recorded and can be posted at any time really against against your knowledge and you don't even know which is the scary thing so i think it's important for kids to really you know realize the boundaries and the importance of their privacy and the privacy of others because it can come back to haunt you Huge, huge. And I think too, if anything, I'd like to put out there for the parents of someone who was in film and television, I know how much editing 
can doctor everything. So please let your children know that when you're out there, be prepared that, you know, people can edit and doctor anything they want. It doesn't, it's not true. There's so much non, most of it is more skewed to non truth than truth. Right. So the parents can understand what that whole area is. What's your, I know, what's your, um, Kasha or Doris, Sonia, what are your children, what do you find and see around the whole social media? Because there's so much bullying around social media with children. Um, what do you do to help arm them to get them through? Because I know when there is a lot of bullying, especially around social media, it can be extremely hurtful and they don't always have the tools. Um, I know we're talking about compassion, where are they coming from? But when, you, when you're the person that's being targeted, especially at such a young age, at an older age, we can kind of go, yeah, okay, whatever. They're just being a distraction. They're jealous. We can wrap our head around that. They're envious. They're angry, whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. But as children, what, what do you, what do you do? Have any of your children encountered that or witnessed that? They have, um, not directly to themselves, but they, my daughter was involved in a scenario a few years back and it goes back to when I think they were 12 or 13 when, when, um, I won't explain it, but there was an incident about a photo that was asked to required of a girl to a boy. And anyway, my, my daughter's friend was bullied over it. And what my daughter does, uh, she stays away from social media, but she's a a very big advocate. So she would defend her friend. And we've taught them to not just be careful what they say, but definitely support your friend and make sure that no, no wrongdoing is done. This is, this is how she is. I've never taught this. She's an advocate, true and true. It can get a little bit uh, aggressive sometimes because they are teenagers. They can get a little carried away, but they are honestly just there to support their friends. But they see it from that perspective so young, they know what not to do now. I love that because what you've done now is you've empowered your daughter to say, be that good friend, stand up for who they are. And I think that this is the one thing that there's such a need right now from children to want to be accepted because I believe what's happened with social media and they're concerned with their likes and their followers. And Oh my gosh, sometimes I listen to these children and they're like, that defines who they are. And I'm like, and I, what I love about what you've said, Doris is what we say is which defines who we are is our circle. Like in terms of people, our friendships, how we're contributing, whether that's one person or 100 people, we don't really care. <laughs> you know, It's like, that's part of that space of moving, but how can you be that loyal friend? And I think that's one thing that if parents are listening, if they're not sure what to say to their parent or to their children, what you just said there, Doris was brilliant to empower them to be good friends outside of whatever that social media is. And to say, you know what, we don't even have to interact with that. We know it's not true. And I'm not going to even engage with what you're saying. And to have the strength to do that, to go against what is maybe happening, because that, that drama can snowball so quickly. Yeah. Sonia, have you noticed that with your girls who are teenagers? So yeah, so um, my oldest is, is 15, almost 16. And, and I personally, as a parent, discouraged as much as I possibly could to even own a cell phone, um, let alone social media. And I really held out as long as I possibly could with her, only because I knew and just I guess the type of business that I was in, I would hear a lot of stories of what some of the kids were going through and parents sharing with me. So I had that awareness of the potential kind of road that they could go down really inadvertently with social media and unfortunately get themselves into a situation that they weren't mentally ready or prepared to to handle. So um, I really, really discourage social media, but when they are or if they are, I really speak to them about who cares, who comments, who cares, who likes, who cares. Like you just, that doesn't define you. It's so superficial and that person, that girl, that boy in your class that really needs that validation. Let's discuss really why they need that and what's behind that. Yeah, you know, I I love what you say there, because one of the things that has to happen more in families, and you just hit it was communication, and knowing that it's not for people that I, a lot of parents come and they're so struggling, and they're frustrated, but it starts with you communicating to them, and building that strong foundation of allowing your children to make choices. I know I used to say to my kids when they were small and it worked really well, they would say, mommy, you know, what time should I be home? And I'd say, well, what time do you think you should be home? And the first time I said that to my daughter, she was going to her first party, you know, she was in grade nine. And I said, well, what time do you think you should be home? And she said, 
oh, I think maybe midnight. And I said, okay, then that's fine. I'm in agreement with that. You be home at midnight. You've made the choice. So now you're responsible to be home at midnight. So she comes in, it's like not even 11 o'clock. And I said, what are you doing? It's not even 11 o'clock. And she said, the party was boring. And I didn't want to waste <laughs> time there. And they were just kind of drinking. And I wasn't interested in that. I'm too young. I have other things I want to do. But because I taught her from when she was very small, my children to make choices that were good for them. And then if they didn't work out, I said, well, you made that choice. Now what can we do to maybe make a better choice. And that was that communication banter we had back and forth. Right. And it served them. So now as young adults being in their mid twenties, now they're able to say, wait a minute, I made that choice, but okay, I'm responsible for it. I can back out now and make a different choice. So this is what I love about the communication factor. So I know we're gonna take a quick break. When I come back, I wanna hear from you guys some of the things that you've done with your children to help them make better choices and your communication so the people listening can really get a good idea of what they can implement for their own families to make sure your kids are navigating through these tough waters. So we'll be back right after the break. Welcome back. You know what? I am loving this episode. We have three and not only brilliant businesswomen, but they're also amazing moms. We were chatting on the break. But before we get there, I want to encourage you go to tracyalclark.com. We have a brand new website, easy to navigate and download your free 18 minute clearing out the weeds. But there's a lot of stuff there to help you stay on your spiritual path. It'll keep you, a, it's a clearing, not a meditation. So it clears the energy. So I, on this break, we were having a great chat. We could probably talk forever. And we were talking about communication before I left and how I gave my children choices. And Kasha, you brought up an incredible, I had so many chills when you brought this up. Can you repeat please for our listeners what we were talking about on the break? So I've noticed that recently uh, more and more kids that are struggling uh, with in-person communication. Uh, and like you said, you are giving uh, your. You say you make a mistake with one and then not with the other. So it was a, it was even like you would do everything for them because you just wanted to do it right. So you would say, OK, I would order food for them. I would cook for them. I would do all this stuff because, well, growing up, I did this. So I mastered it because I had parents who didn't speak English well. So I just did it. I learned on my own. Well, I forget they have to learn that process as well. And we had a small rude awakening one day when my sister-in-law was babysitting my kids at 12 and 10 and they were trying to make a pizza and they didn't know how to use the oven. Wow. And they almost burnt the house down because they used the wrong part of the oven. And they called, they say they figured it out, but they didn't know how to work. And I thought, well, that was my mistake. Well, I don't think they were that old. Maybe they were a bit younger. But even then, they should have known that. Simple tools like that. I was cooking when I was in my single-digit ages, like 8, 9, 10. Yeah, so I think we were all forced to learn those skills, right, when we were young. And I know as a single mom for so many, like for 15 years, like most, like from the time they were 5 and 8, they, I was a single parent until they left out of the house. And so they were forced to have to learn because I couldn't keep up, right? So I'm like, here's how you cook toast. Here's how you put, but that's a really cool, I love that example because it does show from the simple things that we're doing for our children. So they don't know how to do it. And then they're blaming them for not knowing how to do it to some more complicated issues and things about interaction and communicating face-to-face. -face. Sonia, have you had experiences like that? <laughs> this is a huge topic and um, I see it quite a bit in my line of business. Not so much now because I don't really deal with the kids anymore, but um, I raised my children kind of the way you did and simply because that's the way I was raised. So my dad for being an immigrant, you know, I look back and I say, he did a great job in the sense that we would say, dad, da, 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 can we get it? And he's like, well, what do you think? Yeah. How do you feel? And he would allow us to go out and make our own decisions. And if we fell on our face, we fell on our face, but we learned how to pick ourselves up mm -hmm. and we became independent thinkers. And I grew up, I think a little, I, I don't know, I guess quickly um, or, or just became more of an old soul because I was given that trust and that independence and to think for myself. And that served me so well. And so I implemented that from the beginning with my children, even when they were small and said, mom, how do you spell blah, blah, blah. I would never just give them the answer. 
you know, I would help them after, but I would say, well, how do you think you spell that? You know, just to kind of train their brain to be independent thinkers. And in my line of work at the spa, you would see that some of those kind of what they call helicopter parents, you know, little girls would have to pick their nail polish and she picked blue. She really wanted blue. And then mom would kind of come in and be like, are you sure you want blue? Don't you want the light pink? And I'm just kind of observing, and you see the little girl kind of now just go into a state of confusion and step back. And now she's confused between pink, blue, and now she can't make a decision at all. And I just want to be like, just let her pick blue. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, because the pick, the, it's interesting. This is a great example for people listening. So she wants blue, the mother's saying pink. So now she doesn't want to disappoint her mother. So she right. thinks her decision is wrong. So then she takes on it. How many times in life is this happening where the children now don't want to disappoint their parents? So then they're just trying to figure out, well, what would my parent want versus what do I want? But they're also being to trust yeah. their own intuition of yeah. what she originally wanted. Yeah, I love that. And that's so true. And I love because it's a simple way of people understanding. And and what I think people forget as with children that we're here to always say, just raise really good humans and make sure that they're very actively involved. They're compassionate, you know, right. they're, they're giving. And if we're trying to mold them into a lot of parents, like you said, Doris, like many asses, it doesn't work that way. They come with different feelings, different reasons to be here, different thought forms. And one of the things I don't think anybody really talks about is most of the kids born today are also extremely sensitive. They're very empathic. They they feel a lot, but because they're not taught what's happening to their body and why they feel, because I really believe in the work I do and what I see is that kids are here to change the old systems. Kids are here to say, this doesn't work anymore. So if we're trying to always push our old belief systems on these children, how, no wonder they're resisting everything. No wonder they're turning, they don't know what to do. So what do they do is they follow the crowd, which is turning to things that are not as good for them, like the drugs or the alcohol to just bury and mask how they're feeling suppressed. The kids turn to this stuff, not because it's just the crowd. It's because they don't feel heard. They don't feel they fit. They don't know where their purpose is. They don't know where they belong. They don't know how to even interact. And like Kesha, you were saying, like, they don't even know how to order a pizza online. They don't want to talk to the delivery man. I recently I talked to my neighbor. She has an amazing uh, networking company here, but they work with many millennials. Yeah. And what she noticed that they are amazing what they're doing online, like with the internet. But if there is any problem, any conflict that they have to deal with face to face or pick up the phone and ask for payment that they didn't receive, they don't know how to do it. They're asking older people for help, can you teach me how to even write a nice email to remind that I still need that payment? Not even like, I'm not talking even about to pick up the phone and call them to write a nice email. And she said, it's, uh, it's scary. Yeah, it's scary. I think the life skills definitely have been lost out of the system, like as, as a technology. And the thing that I find really scary about that you were saying with the email is if you get a text message or an email and you're in a bad mood, you could read it the wrong way, right? I used to, when I, when I managed a lot, of, a lot of people in corporate, I would say, if you're having a bad day, like don't even open your email. And if you need to communicate something, pick up the phone. Cause I spend half my time in upper management, like dissecting, okay, what did you say? No, this is what they meant. You know, like mending relationships. Cause now you've got grown adults fighting with each other over a text message or over an email. And they're like, well, that's not what I meant. Well, if you're worried, they're not going to be able to receive it. So this is very interesting even to communicate and craft a proper email. So is it fear is when they report back to you, is it the fear of it's not going to be received or is it the fear of, I just don't even know how to make this polite. <laughs> I think it's more fear how that's going to be received and how they're going to be uh, perceived by that person, right? So it's like, yeah, they're not feeling good enough to stand up for themselves and yeah. they have no clue how to approach that. 
it's like there's such a rating system now with the kids and being in social media they don't they want to make sure that they're perceived a certain way so even to say this is like you said this is what is you owe me that money and thank you very much and when are you able to give it to me like it's pretty simple right it doesn't have to be be that that difficult Doris what else have you noticed with that comes up or that your kids say you're talking about giving them choices and communication um, and we we're just saying they can't even write an email. So what do you find with the younger kids of where some of their blocks are because parents have been doing so much for them too and teachers of just asking for what they want outside of their family? Oh, I, that this is it. And I feel like I wonder if they're stemming so much anxiety versus because they haven't had the opportunity to be able to do things on their own. They fear doing it wrong and they just get anxious. So they just allow others to do it, but they never learn any of these like regular skills because, well, maybe they think it'll be done for them. I don't know. But I think that stems from a lot of anxiety with the unknown because they haven't had a chance to do anything that was so simple simple yeah. tools like this. So when a little thing goes wrong, they don't know how to manage it because they've never learned the skills or the tools to be able to, to actually uh, do anything simple, to execute it in any way. So I don't know. I almost wonder if there is a stem with the anxiety of, of just doing so much for them. And like Sonia says, I love that she does this, that allows them to make the mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once I started to do this, I found such a huge change in the independence. And like, like uh, Cassia said, my, my daughter now calls. She doesn't text. She doesn't email my older daughter. Yeah. Five, five seconds, she's calling me instead of texting me, which is so incredible. Yeah. Well, it's empowering to them. And I think now that we have to start to empower our children and it's no different than we're doing energy work together or we're looking at patterns to remove and, you know, that our, we have our wonderful release, like go tool that I, I love and always adding to it. And I think that empowering children isn't really done correctly anymore. And by having her call you and empowering her and making choices, it, it empowers her, him and also being there to be able to help them see a different path or direction when they do fall down, not screaming at them or yelling at them or doing all of that, you know, negative programming where then they will retreat like what you were saying, Sonia. Yeah, and that's huge because your instinct is just like, ah, why did you do that? But one thing I've tried to kind of step back and, and when my child is telling me something or this happened at school or they're nervous about something or they're not sure what decision to make, what I bring it back down to and I say, okay, so when you think about that, how does that feel? Yeah. Does it feel good or does it feel bad? You know, and I allow them to tune into how things make them feel as kind of how to guide them of where to go in life, of which path, instead of, you know, such the mental, which is, I feel that is, is, is doing more of the playing on the anxiety and the fears as opposed to just, how does it feel? And if it feels good, then you just do it. And while I'm always here to support you and I'll always have your back, but I can't make your decisions for you. Yeah, it's a beautiful old energy tool that I love. And, and we all know in this group, we know if people haven't heard this before, your brain and kids need to remember your brain is there to keep you feel safe, right? The brain and the mind is going to say this over and over like a broken record. It keeps you safe. Doing bad things you know you shouldn't be doing. Having that real conscious kind of come up knowing it's because of the brain and that old teaching, which I still love for children. If you haven't tried it with your children, like what you were saying, Sonia, is if it feels expansive, you know you're moving in the right place. If it feels right. contracted, maybe look a little bit more and wonder why. Sometimes you'll feel more contracted because you are afraid to go into that place, even though it's a good place to go, right? And so right. a lot of times children will not go into the place that feels really good. And adults do this too because they have a fear that everything will change. It'll change to the better. It'll change. So that expansive and contraction of the body, it's telling you, the body's telling you what's happening. I think one of the things that I, I want to actually be able to touch on a little bit is it, and it's a big topic is I call everything's a spirit in my world, but the spirit of anxiety, the spirit of depression, we hear it and we hear it in little kids that are like four or five years old. I'm like, how do they even know what that is? Crazy. I know. And I, I don't, I'd love to hear what you guys hear from just your children chattering, not necessarily them, um, even in the school, because you hear it a lot. It's like, it's a word that's just thrown out there. It's like, okay, you're not really, if they don't even know what real depression is, you know, which is kind of an insult to someone that really has depression. You know, I don't want to get out today. I'm depressed. Well, no, you're not. You're just tired. <laughs> it's a big difference. 
Kasha, what have you noticed with those two? Because it's huge. Kids say it all the time now. Uh, I think it's uh, that's kind of labeling as well, right? Because like, percent. Yes, because the doctors they need to label you in any way to I don't know to try to help you. So if it's not even just depression, it's like ADHD, anything, right? They don't know how to help them. They they just need to give you a pill and deal with that by yourself. But I've noticed even my kids, they, um, right now they come to me and they actually say thank you for support that I give them, right? But remember, uh, that was a long time ago. My sister, uh, she gave me an advice and that is what is helping me to go through those times. It was like we have to prepare our kids for the time that we are not with them. Yes. From the day they're born. I love that. You know when our time ends, mm -hmm. they are probably they might stay a bit longer here without us. So what do I want them to know when I'm not around them? Yeah, I get chills and it's true. What can you, how can you empower them for when we're not here mm -hmm. and we do go and goes back to what Doris was saying earlier. We can't do everything for them and empower them to make those good decisions. Sonia, how, what do you have to contribute to that? You know, that happened to me um, from a young age. My daughter was diagnosed with celiac at the age of two. And so obviously when she was two, three, four and quite young, I had to, you know, advocate for her when we were out in restaurants. Does this have wheat? Does that have wheat cross-contamination? It's quite exhausting. But there was always in the back of my head that when she goes out with her friends, will she be able to, you know, ask all the questions that, that she needs to in order to get, you know, a gluten free meal. And so as she got older, I found myself just kind of biting my tongue and teaching her to say, Hi, I have a gluten allergy. Can I get this gluten free? And people are like, Oh, you let her order for herself. And I said, Yes, I do. And I don't speak up for my children when it comes to ordering, because that's the first interaction that they can have a out in the public speaking up for themselves, because you see a lot of moms that are be like, Oh, he'll just have this or she'll just have that. And I never did that as soon as they were able to speak. And now my daughter goes out to a restaurant and she's just, I have a gluten allergy. Are the potatoes gluten-free? <laughs> without the, can you have kind of a Caesar salad without the croutons? And I kind of step back and say like, I feel okay now that if she goes out with friends, she's good. She knows what to do. And I empowered yeah. her to do that. So such an important lesson to teach your kids. Yeah, empowerment. I think that's that's the big thing. And when they're really empowered from a small age, they don't, it's not that like human beings, you're going to have a glimpse or a blip, I guess, of maybe some anxiousness or, or feel like you're depressed when you're going through heavy, heavy stuff. But it's a moment in time. I think that's what people need to understand, especially children. It's just a moment of something they're going through. It's not that you don't have that for your life. Like a lot of these things, they're not for your life. They're just there. But I find with a lot of kids, they do take things on like those labels. If they're not empowered, like your daughter, Sonia, they take on these labels and then they make it that that's their whole life. Like I have anxiety, so I have anxiety my whole life. I'm depressed. So I'm going to be depressed my whole life. And now they've just imprinted that energy and everyone's like, oh, I have depression too. It's, it's like, it's a club. Oh, I have anxiety too. Rather than what, do you, what can you do to get rid of that? What can you do? And by empowering a child and by empowering the child to actually make decisions and supporting them when they go up and down, that fear of change, the fear of not knowing what's happening, that will start to dissolve. And then they get excited about change. And I think that's a big thing with kids. They don't get excited with change. They're taught from their parents to fear change. Do you find definitely? That Actually, that that's that is the truth with with so many people. But adults also have that same feeling as well. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to even when you were saying why kids actually do have anxiety and depression or the feeling of. I find that it's a, it's it's the same. The parents aren't in tune with their own selves as well, so they don't know how to feel. Now we have all these empathetic children coming out, but the parents don't understand it because they're not under, under, understanding of it. So now, like we said before, they've been labeled. They've got these labels that they're ADHD or however, but it's not that. It's just that we don't understand that they are feeling other people's 
issues as well. Or they have a sad day, but you say, well, you'll snap out of it. You will be okay. But we give them more fear and then we put them into more of a bubble. And I find that they, they sort of uh, take even more of that feeling on as well. So I don't know if it just stems from a lot of that feeling of fear. No, you're, you're a hundred percent correct because the parents don't understand. Like you, we are all working together every day. That's why we do the miraculous program. We go and we learn and we're, you know, we're doing work as a whole collective. Like I'm telling you, anybody listening, that's the program you want to be. If you want to know more about these ladies and what they do with their children, because that's interactive. That's what are other people doing? Because they don't, people don't understand. These children are very aware, very enlightened and exactly no different than when we were all saying at one point being so um, empathetic that we could walk into a room and my whole body would shake. Well, these kids are doing that because you're picking up all the energies and you don't know how to process it. You're not taught how to move it through. And this is why for me, one of the goals is to create a system so we can help these children understand how to move it through. And then they don't suffer with anxiety. They're not going to suffer with that because exactly if the parent doesn't understand, they don't know. And then they're like, well, get over it. What's wrong with you? Nothing. These children are running on our computers. We're a computer system. And these children literally coming in now, they're running on computer software that is like, hasn't even been invented for us yet. It's like 10 years down the road. So they're so highly advanced in their software. And we're trying to put them in a Commodore 64 and say, run it this way. And they're like, my body doesn't work that way. My brain goes really, really fast. We're moving very quickly. Like, check out these kids online. They can be online on their phone. They're having five conversations or blah, 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 blah. And their parents are like, Oh, how do you do that? Right? Because their software of their physical body, their connections are so advanced compared to their parents, which we need. That's how we get change. Or we'd still be in horse and buggy day. Like, so I love what you say there. It's so true. Have Kesha or Sonia, have either of you noticed that? So, um, when my daughter, when she broke her leg, um, she her whole life collapsed in one day because she's a very good soccer player right and the problem what i've noticed whenever we went to the doctor the doctor doctors they were programming her mind like for a long recovery this gonna take you this much or that much and i was always telling her like diagnosis is important you broke your leg you need a surgery but do not listen to the prognosis because it's up to you when you're going to heal, when you're going to be back on the field. And then she's uh, on the field now kind of playing soccer. But if she would listen to what they say, she would probably be still in bed. Yeah, you know what? I love you shared that because people to listen, we see this all the time in our community. And because the community came behind and rallied her and was helping her energetically and physically and emotionally and helping you when you post that. And that's what we do in the community. And I want to talk about that for a minute quickly before we have to go, because that's what we do in the community is make sure that your families are supported, you're supported. And exactly what you said, remove that programming that because they can tell you it's based six months to heal based on a stat, she doesn't have to be the stat. So she heals quicker. She restores faster. She's motivated. She's back on that soccer field. And she loves it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. And I love the fact that, you know, this is, this is there. Um, I just want to ask before, I know we have to go soon quickly. Anybody have anything they'd like to say? You're all in the miraculous program. You're supporting each other. It is a place you guys go at tracyalclark.com. If you want to even interact with more incredible women like this and men that are changing the world together, any final words before we go? I'd love to just kind of um, leave everyone with this. And when you speak about the miraculous program, you have more than just the miraculous program. There's many other um, avenues that one can, can explore. Do the work, do the work as parents. That's the best thing that we can do for our children is to heal within ourselves and to do the work ourselves because it's a domino effect and it becomes effortless. So for Kasha to immediately say, yes, this is the diagnosis, but not, she had the different mindset to teach that to her child. So now her child's going to grow up with, I'm in control of my life. But if Kasha wasn't there, her daughter wouldn't have been there. So it's not about fixing the kids. It's about getting whole ourselves and, and just joining whatever resonates with everyone. You know, I, I devote about 10 hours a week between your evolutionary group, your body regen, online calls, and I've made a commitment, but this is what has served me the most in raising children that are empathetic and setting them up for success. 
You said it amazing. Change yourself. That's what I had to do. That's what all of these women had to do. Change themselves to change your children. Stop right. changing your children. Change yourself first. Watch how your children will get it because the energy will go down. We have only a minute left. Doris, anything quickly you want to say? I totally agree. It's, a, it's an amazing program and living the life of this and teaching your kids to live this way as well. It, you, can't, you can't beat that. No. You are in power of yourself. You empower you and empower others. I want to thank all of you for joining me. We are going to be going to, there is another episode to this coming out. So guys, you can watch. We're going to talk more with children, maybe get some more of them on. If you have questions or things you want to know about kids, please send us at contact at tracyalclark.com your comments. We will do a show on that. Have an incredible week and we will see you next week on the Tracy L. Clark Show where we're going to get Meg here to teach you how to talk to your animals. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Tracy L. Clark Show with me, Tracy L., where I teach you how to live your extraordinary life. Tune in every Tuesday, 8 a.m. Pacific, on Transformation Talk Radio, where I combine ministry, science, and spirituality, revealing the steps you need to transcend perceived limitations. As a remarkable leader and pioneer in my field, I, Tracy L, will provide insights energetically and the tools required to move you forward. For more information on my partnership program, check us out at tracylclark.com. <laughs>